His list of prizes and awards is so long that it would take up all of his time to read it, so I won't. And he's very much sought after as a speaker, and you are about to find out why. His title is Feeding the World in 2050. Please welcome Matt Ridley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Follow that. Um, I'm acutely aware that this is an immensely distinguished audience and one that knows a, a lot more about the subject I'm about to talk about than I do, probably. And so, um, uh, and a lot, I've already learned a lot this afternoon. It's been a fascinating meeting. But perhaps it's helpful to stand right back and look at the thing in the grand scheme, the big picture of what's happening. The meaning of the word optimist has changed over the centuries. Uh, when it was first used by Voltaire in the 1700s, it meant somebody who thinks the world is perfect. It is as good as it can possibly get. It has reached its optimum. Today, that's what pessimists think. <laughs> that things can't get better. They can only get worse. And I think they're wrong. I think that wonderful as the achievements of humanity are so far, this world is a veil of tears compared with what we could achieve. What drives human progress is the belief that you ain't seen nothing yet. So how are we going to feed the world in 2050? Let's start by looking backwards. In my lifetime, roughly speaking, the population of the world has doubled. But people have more food. In every continent, the calories available per capita have gone steadily up. Even in Africa, they're 25% higher than they were 50 years ago. And crop prices have fallen over that time. In real terms, the prices of wheat and corn are way lower than they were in earlier parts of this century. Although, of course, they've ticked up sharply in the last few years. And at the same time, we've actually released quite a lot of land to forest in parts of the world. Particularly, for example, in New England, where this wall runs through what used to be fields and is now woodland. Um, about 70% of New England is now woodland. About 70% of New England used to be farmland. Uh, and that's true of large parts of Northern Europe, too. Italy has more forest cover now than at any time since the Roman Empire. And it's even true in some parts of the developing world. Vietnam, for example, has increasing for forest cover. And, of course, this is because we've managed to increase the yield per acre of our crops so much that we can feed more people with more food and still release some land. The great trebling, I call it, the, the fact that the total harvest of rice, wheat and maize, the three biggest calorie providers, uh, has trebled in 60 years, while the black line along the bottom shows that the, the acres harvested for these three crops has hardly changed in that time. And remember, we were told by the pessimists throughout this period that it could not be done. Here's one. Lester Brown, in 1974, farmers can no longer keep up with rising demand for food and famine is inevitable. Here's another. In 1981, global food security is increasing. Lester Brown. And here's one in 1984, the slim margin between food production and population growth continues to narrow. Lester Brown in 1984. Population growth is exceeding farmers' ability to keep up. Lester Brown in 1989. Seldom has the world faced an unfolding emergency whose dimensions are as clear as the growing imbalance between food and people. Lester Brown in 1994. Cheap food may now be history. 